Call to order the City Council work session for City of East Grand Forks, Monday, March 12, 2018. It's now 5 o'clock. The City Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Steve Gander? Here. Council President Mark Olstead? Here. Council Vice President Chad Grassel? Here. Council Members Clarence Vetter? Here. Mike Pekshavinsky? Here. Tim Riopelle? Here. Henry Tweeton? Here. Mark Demers? Present. Does determine a quorum. Number one, potential location for new local traffic bridge. Mr. Haugen. Thank you. Um, as you know, early, late or last year there was discussion between both Grand Forks and the Grand Forks Council about revisiting the future river crossings. And we had a joint meeting um, end of November, and uh, the direction at that meeting was to have uh, the MPO do some traffic analysis of what it would be, what would happen to our street network if we did add some river crossings. Um, today I have uh, the results to present to you. Um, you have been provided the opportunity to look at the detailed tech memo um, and also the PowerPoint beforehand. And I'm uh, not going to go through everything, but just highlight <coughs> what we're finding. I do want to emphasize that this is part of a bigger street and highway plan update that we are doing. Uh, we are in the midst of that right now, and we do have a deadline by the end of this year to have a, an adopted document. So um, uh, we're trying not to spend uh, months and months on an issue. We're trying to get information out and hopefully some direction from Grand Forks and East Grand Forks as to what to do with this particular item. We are talking just about the river crossings. In the end, there was discussion of doing five in the end, we looked at four different crossings, starting northward, 24th Avenue, then doing 32nd, 47th, and then what we call Merrifield Road. We um, looked at these in our travel demand forecasting uh, software. To sort of make everything comparable, we made sure that all of the crossings were just two-lane bridges. We weren't trying to have one be four lanes, one be two lanes. They're all equally, they all make connections to two lane roads. Um, we did not add any interchanges or any other uh, connections to US 2. Uh, so they should all be very representative and, and uh, very uh, similar in how they would impact traffic. The only thing differing between these are just the location and how they tie into the rest of the network that exists. And so this graphic is, gives you just a general overall of key intersections in East Grand Forks and Grand Forks as to what the current level of service is at those intersections, what they, we are projecting it to be in 2045, and then with each individual crossing analysis. Um, just in general, that the further north you are, the better it serves as a local traffic. Um, the further south you are, the less it serves as local traffic and more as regional traffic. So these basic uh, components are what happens um, with the analysis that we've done. The next few slides are just the individual maps that we are producing for this. Um, if anybody asks why are we discussing river crossings again, um, the graphic on the far right, if you look at the three existing bridges, uh, they all start to have uh, over capacity concerns in the future. And most of these three river crossings, there's really not opportunity to have lane capacity to them. So the option is to look at another location. I won't go through each of these individually have them, um, but in, in the end, we, we still have some capacity issues, particularly on the Sorley Bridge, even if we do add another bridge to the south. Uh, however, we do have some benefit for the Gateway Drive Bridge. Of course, the bridge that uh, benefits the most is the Point Bridge. The um, other thing to make note is uh, Belmont Road in Grand Forks is one of the corridors of concern. And under all, all of these options, it does have improvement. It's just the level of improvement degrades as the further south you go within the river crossing. 
And we did take a look at, um, to give some sense of regionalism versus local traffic, we picked two spots in the network and sort of compared and contrast those two spots as to how they uh, treat traffic. Uh, we looked at Bigland Road, just north of Reinhardt Drive, and saw how our model was forecasting changes in traffic. And that's what this is trying to display to you, that it does, each of those crossings does reduce traffic on Bigland Road, just north of Reinhardt. But as again, as you go south, the less traffic impact it has. All, all of these additional river crossings do have a component where they draw traffic off of US-2 on the east side or attract traffic to US-2 on the east side. So we looked at the Mallory crossing of the Red Lake River and to see how traffic has changed there. And that's where I get to the comment I made earlier that the further north you are with the bridge, the more it addresses local traffic. The further south, the more it addresses regional traffic. If my mouse worked, I would point out the bottom table that you see on the top row of that is the traffic over the Mallory Bridge. It's fairly similar for 24th Avenue or 32nd Avenue Bridge. It starts to drop a bit when you get further south on 47th and um, Merrifield Road. But the bottom row is that traffic on Reinhardt, or just north of Reinhardt on Bigland Road. And you see at uh, 24th and 32nd, they have fairly similar. Uh, the, the traffic on Bigland Road is decreased to less, at least. When you get to 47th, uh, it starts to flip where more of the traffic on Mallory Bridge is using that new connection than people coming from the current built up area to that new location. And then it just flips more when you get to Merrifield, where it's serving more traffic off of that Mallory Bridge area. Uh, the other thing that the model does, it gives us some sense of how these things would, we didn't do a benefit cost ratio, but we have the basic data that you would use for benefit cost. Again, the further north you are, the more benefits in vehicle miles traveled and vehicle hours traveled. We have more decrease in those items. The further south you get, the less they are. Uh, the one exception is Merrifield has a lot of uh, savings in miles and in hours, uh, whereas 47th Avenue, you do have savings in miles traveled, but it was the only of the four alternatives that increased the actual hours you have traveling. So when you look at benefit costs, one of the, your, your two main benefits are are you decreasing the miles people travel? Are you decreasing the hours people travel? In this case, 47th Avenue, it would be a, a, a negative to that benefit in the fact that it's increasing the hours people would travel. I think that our next step is trying to see if there's a way that we can focus, again, the purpose as we understood our mission was to try to help you understand which of these would serve that local traffic and see if we can't eliminate some of the four crossings because they simply aren't really serving local traffic. That doesn't mean those crossings that they're eliminated for this purpose <coughs> aren't still reviewed for other purposes, but we're trying to focus on that local traffic. And uh, the MPO board held a joint meeting a few weeks ago. Uh, we didn't have the best attendance, so the board directed me to come back and go through each of the individual city councils and county commissions to see if there was any direction that they wanted to provide back to the end of the board. That's my brief briefing for today. We have to answer any questions if there are any. Anybody have any questions? Mr. Better? I don't, I don't have any questions. I guess in the sake of study, I would propose that we would eliminate the 47th crossing and the field road crossing and stay on too many things for the local traffic. Keep the 24th and the 32nd. Is there still consideration of two bridges? In other words, potentially 32nd and then adding 
something south of that, or is that not being discussed much anymore? Well, that's still being discussed. The, the counties are very interested in airfield location. Um, so there is also, historically has been, and probably in the future will continue to be a, an interest in having truck traffic and other uh, agricultural traffic, particularly in the fall and spring, shifted away from the urban area. And so that's what Merrifield would provide. And it's been studied pretty extensively in the past. Uh, so it's got a lot of history going behind it. It looks like because of the different funding and, and you know, one constituency has one thing to gain and one has another, probably in one way the conversation goes ahead two separate conversations, you know, one to serve the truck and, and farm, the other to serve the, the neighborhoods. And I say neighborhoods because you've always shown in your traffic studies that <coughs> it gets better for everyone. It gets better for residents of Grand Forks and it gets better for the residents of East Grand Forks to have a South End neighborhood bridge. It's not an East Grand Forks issue, it's not a Grand Forks issue, it's a, it's a community-wide issue in, involving both cities. And I sure would not want to live along the Minnesota Fourth Corridor right now, and I wouldn't necessarily like the traffic up and down Reeves and Belmont unnecessarily going north and south, um, because they're all trying to come <coughs> from the south, cross over and go back south again. Um, so I, I think it's evident that uh, my estimation is it's very practical to, to move forward with one of these neighborhood bridges, whichever one serves the two communities the best. Anything else? You mentioned that <coughs> there wasn't anything really looked at the Highway 2 crossing in, in East Grand Minnesota side, but would there be additional work that is needed if, depending on where it's at, 32nd or 47th? Yeah, it would depend a little bit on how it lands on, on 24th or 32nd. And part of uh, past plans has assumed that East Grand Forks would construct a roadway as part of its natural development south of the point area and east-west roadway to help connect traffic. Um, so that roadway is conceived to connect where uh, the new uh, Polk, Polk 72 connects to Biglin Road, so you'd have sort of a natural touch point there with Polk 72 that connects to the Mallory Bridge over the US 2. So would that, if things just fell apart and development didn't happen on the south end, uh, there still is the natural section line road that uh, serves as that connection, and that's what we modeled is just that natural section line roadway, even though it might have a, a nice zig there at the uh, old 220 get back down to the section line. Um, they're still tracking a lot of traffic because of the mile save and the hour save. Is that 190th down there? Is that what it is? Maybe someone can help me. Is that where, is that where the radio tower is at, or is that too far south? That's too far south. So it'd be... Okay. There's a row of uh, rural houses, right? All right, I know where that is. It's almost so Jay Holm. Yeah, okay. yeah the, the line is. All right. <coughs> yeah. Just want to get an idea in my head where it would be. So there would be some work that would be needed there because it's it's a uh, some of it's gravel, some of it's overlay. Currently. Yes. And that would have to be redone. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I think what they're saying with taking it. Mr. Vetter says take out uh, Merrifield and 47th. I would think that would probably be the proper thing to do. I don't know if anybody else have any questions. I see none, sir. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Um, number two, request for approval for Sandy's first resubdivision. Ms. Alice. I'm just bringing this to your attention. This is the property behind Hardware Hank. They've come to an agreement with the city to um, purchase 40 feet 
for outdoor storage and for better access to the back of their property. It's going to remain a 40-foot easement, so there will be no buildings or any type of um, like uh, additions on that. Um, it's just for their use, and so um, because we're just moving property line, this will go for public hearing next week, and then approval, uh, final approval of the plan. So, does anybody have any questions on that? See none. Okay. Move on to the next one. Consider zoning district's ordinance amendment. Um, our zoning ordinance was adopted in 2001, formally with permitted uses and special uses uh, per zoning district. We're just updating that for some uses that have come up um, in the recent years that we've seen on the Grand Fork side, and we kind of want to mirror that. For our R1, 2, 3, and PUD districts, um, Microcells or small cell antennas are becoming kind of um, a request. Uh, Attorney Gulstead had asked that I add those as uses into those districts, provided that they meet the requirements of a right-of-way ordinance that the city is going to establish. So um, if you have any questions pertaining to the right-of-way ordinance, uh, Attorney Gulstead can answer those. Um, we don't have a formal one at this point. But it would be something that if, uh, or once it's adopted, I don't want to come back then and amend those zoning districts to allow for those small cell towers. Um, more specifically, the use of commercial properties for places of worship, churches, synagogues, has kind of become popular, uh, mainly for a couple of reasons. One, the buildings in a commercial district are quite large. They already have sufficient parking. They already have um, major collector roads, those types of things that they can access. Uh, one of the things that they are asking is that rather than rezone it to residential so that they can have that location, um, which is what our current zoning ordinance allows, um, they'd like to re keep it commercial. Um, keep in mind, the Red Cross building used to be a church, and, and when you have large facilities like that in a residential property, you don't want to, um, if the church moves or expands or goes to a different location, now you have this very large bis uh, building in a residential area that isn't used for a lot of things. So we're starting to notice churches relocating and shopping centers, old um, movie theaters, places that already have sufficient parking. They already have the very large building that can accommodate those types of people. So that would be the major use that would be added to our C1 and C2. Um, just some of the smaller uses that aren't well-defined, like photography studios, health clubs, um, those types of things in our highway commercial contractors' yards and offices, if they want to. We have a number of them already on Highway 2. We're seeing some electrical uh, businesses or plumbing businesses that want to have a small showroom but an office and then storage. Um, so because we already have it in the district, this would then just clarify that in the, um, in the uh, district itself. And then in terms of industrial, there were a few uses. Um, that we don't have currently, but would fit well into the industrial uh, park um, or our limited industrial. That would be breweries, wineries, um, distilleries, bottling establishments, those types of things. Uh, they right now are currently packaging um, those items, but then just further defining that. Uh, small animal boarding and daycare facilities. There has been a question as to using a commercial location for that. However, based on um, barking complaints, those types of things, and commercial being located next to residential, whereas industrial is not, we feel that, um, that in industrial areas where we would want a small animal boarding facility. And then lastly, in our general industrial, it would be auction houses and indoor shooting galleries and ranges. Um, all of these uses, are uh, mirroring what Grand Forks allows. So if anybody has any questions on those, otherwise we just go through the formal process of the public hearing and the reading of the ordinances. I do have one question. Yes. Um, you have, you mentioned on the page 44, 
uh, yes. bottling, establishing brewery or winery. Yes. That is currently not allowed in the downtown area, and not. Would not no, be it, it's right now. It's not allowed in any commercial area. And if you would like to see it in a commercial area, we can That's certainly fine. do that. We could add it to our C one and C two. If I think we're looking at. Uh, I think you're talking about like brew pub or something on that line. Well, a microbrewer is somebody. You know, let's say it's half like brothers. Half brothers. Right. right now. I don't think that it is uh, allowed even in the commercial though. No, no. And so if that would be something that we'd want to add for the meeting next time, that's certainly. I don't know, does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Because down the road it might, you know, the old warehouse <coughs> down the street or, you know, something that needs to be looked at. Yeah, might as well plan ahead for it. Yeah, and I have no issues with that. If you'd like to put it in as a special use in case we want to add any conditions. We could do that. Otherwise, just a permitted use. I mean, we do already allow for uh, bars, restaurants, those right. types of things. And I think they're fairly well regulated by the state. So I don't think that, right. from our standpoint, we would need to add it as a special use. We could just add it as a permitted use. So. Just fine with me. Yep. Okay. okay, so we'll make that addition for the next meeting so that that's ready to go. Anybody else have anything on that? Mr. Demers. Thank you. Um, did Grand Forks take any action on their medical dispensary? Or, or they dispensary? haven't at this time. Okay. It might be something we want to look at. And right now, the state of Minnesota designates, I think in statute, like seven spots. Um, but as that changes, we should be prepared to be able to you know, have that type of business as well. And we could certainly go back and address that. Um, I'm just trying to do a couple, well, a larger blanket one right now so that we're not going back and changing the ordinance every couple of months. But since Grand Forks has not addressed it, we're not quite sure yet um, where we want to go with that. Maybe we'll just work with these and then, you know, in the future we can come back and address that independently. So. Anybody else have any questions or suggestions? You know. Okay, thank you, great. Thank, thank you. Number four, request to promote and fill vacant engineer position at fire department. Chief Larson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we visited this in January from a, a vacancy from the retirement of Merle Halverson. Uh, we forwarded to the civil service. Uh, they tested, there was one applicant with over three years experience as a firefighter, and that was Ryan Swan. So he tested, they forwarded to me, we did the interview, talked about expectations and looking for approval to promote Ryan to grade 14, step six. Any other <coughs> questions? See none, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're we'll skip over number five, go to number six, uh, rental request update for the proposed AC Expo gun show. Read. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, so bringing this back from the previous work session we had a couple weeks ago, um, followed up with uh, <clears throat> Kenny, who is the potential organizer of the gun show, the host for the gun show. Uh, and as, as well as a couple of communities that have held gun shows um, hosted by his group, just to ask a few of the questions that you all had. Uh, and those findings were in the work session, uh, the, uh, the RCA. Um, two communities, smaller communities, kind of in the Iron Range of Minnesota that I spoke to, uh, both had positive remarks for the show and the people that it brought to town, the activity that it had. Um, and you can see there... Uh, some of the costs that was associated with, with what they charged him to rent the building, the comments, general comments from both Kenny and from those communities is that typically it brings in 500 to 600 people through the weekend uh, that pay for admission for it. Um, and then Mr. Gallstead and myself both uh, spoke numerous times regarding some of the questions that the council had about safety, um, permitting, licensing, some of those questions. Uh, in conversation with Kenny, the one thing that he said is that typically 75%, he figured, of the vendors that are at the show that would sell firearms are federally licensed dealers. 
um, and that any of them that would have that would sell at the show, of course, would have to follow the standards that they're required to by their license. Um, he wanted to make note that, of course, remember they're not not all vendors are going to sell firearms. Some vendors might sell ammunition only. Some vendors might sell sporting goods or game calls. Um, pretty much, you name it, from a, a hunting or shooting the sport perspective, uh, those vendors might be there. Um, let's see, just kind of going through this as I remember some of the questions. Uh, we talked through a little bit about rules and regulations that he has for his vendors that he and his wife have. They, um, He said they always have a rules and regulations that all the vendors have to sign off on when they sign up as a vendor, pay for a table or a booth. Uh, and he's, he stated that he would be comfortable he and his wife would be comfortable adding something to the rules and regulations about requiring or asking for all firearm sales to go through a background check. Um, but was quick to note, and Mr. Galstead and I talked about it a little bit as well, that he could put that in the rules and regulations, but he didn't feel like he had a heck of a lot of weight in enforcing that because it's not law. Um, so that if there was if there was a private sale, a, a, a one-on-one -on -one sale from somebody that maybe just had signed up a table to show off his antique gun collection um, and, you know, and struck a deal with somebody that wanted to buy it, that, uh, you know, while, while we could ask for that, they didn't have, he didn't have much authority in enforcing that. Um, the other question was about the local gun stores. Uh, he said that prior to having the show here, he would make a trip here to see the venue and know it um, and to get to know the area and try to promote the area a little bit and that that would be one of the first things he would do is stop in at the local gun stores and introduce himself and invite them to participate as a vendor at the show. Uh, Cabela's, he didn't feel like would do any, a show like this, but certainly would bring business to town that would be an interested party of shoppers. Um, and I think the only other kind of just running through the things we discussed is the cost of the rental. Um, I floated at him the, the idea of $500 a day rather than the $300 a day that I had initially brought forward to you. Um, and he stated that he wouldn't be able to do more than $1,000 a day and still be, be able to... $1,000. I'm sorry, $1,000 a weekend. Thank you. $1,000 for the weekend and still be able to make that a successful show from his perspective. So I think I kind of ran through some things quickly there. Um, a few more of the safety things we discussed is is uh, that all of the firearms would be checked in by he or his wife when the vendors arrive. They all get a sticker put on them so that they're they're uh, recognized with the sticker that they are a gun that is at the show or for sale by the show. Uh, they would all get have the chambers or the action zip tied. Many of the vendors would cable tie or have their weapons, the firearms, in a glass encasement, specifically the antique weapons. A lot of times they're locked under a glass encasement. Um, so I think from a safety perspective, they feel like they do a pretty thorough job of that. The sticker that's on the weapon then when it leaves the building, if it's been sold, it's checked by the security guard at the door to make sure that it's a weapon that was um, properly sold and administered by which vendor sold it and that kind of thing. So it seems that they have a pretty thorough grasp on that. I know Mr. Galston talked with the folks in Grand Forks uh, that were involved in the gun show that was held at the Alara Center just two weekends ago and, and kind of we sought some advice from them on what they do and I think and a lot of those those concerns or questions were answered kind of in the zip tying of the chambers and how they're secured to tables and and that sort of thing. Did Cabello say anything? Did uh, were they aware of this? I did not reach out to Cabello's, uh, and that's again going back to Kenny. He stated that that he didn't think Cabello's would participate, but certainly that the people that come to town hopefully would visit the store. Mr. Galston. And, and then just to add on that, I did have a, an opportunity to speak with both uh, Howard Swanson, the city attorney in Grand Forks. Uh, regarding what he, is, uh, on behalf of the city, did. They actually didn't uh, require anything from anybody that was uh, <clears throat> being a part of the gun show uh, that they just left it up to the uh,
contractor or the, the promoter to be responsible for all liability. Um, I did speak with the Alaris Commission. Uh, essentially, they said that their gun show went off without a hitch. Uh, there were, um, and, and what they did is they just basically uh, made sure that the, uh, that the firearms were uh, secured before. Well, actually, what they said they wanted to do next time was potentially make sure that those firearms were secured with zip ties before they entered the building as opposed to once they entered the building and then have them zip tied. Um, however, they also said that they didn't require anything other than the insurance and then the additional indemnification on the, uh, the policy uh, and left the liability all with the, uh, the promoter. Uh, and then just getting back to the licensing and the background check issue, right now I followed up on that. That's not a requirement in the state of Minnesota. Uh, it would be very difficult to enforce something that's not a law to say that they have to do something from a city, from a city standpoint. Mr. Demers. Well, we have the, the ability to put whatever restrictions on our facilities that we want, right? I guess what you mean by that, I have no idea. Well, I guess we would have the ability to require someone to be licensed federally, right? To be, we could, we could try to do that. And I guess how you would, you could enforce it is to say, well, as part of your contract, you have to put down a five thousand dollar deposit. If you're caught doing this, you lose your deposit. But we can do any of those. Right. Things. I'm just saying. I mean, to say it's not enforceable because. There's to, no to say to make it a crime. No, I'm not saying to make it a crime. I'm saying to make it a part of the contract because it's because it's not a crime in the state of Minnesota right now. I know that there's issues, but nobody mm -hmm. seems to be having a big issue with gun shows. Right. And but I was saying to address it through contract language, not statutory language or ordinance language. And then it becomes an enforceability issue. That's the only thing that I'm saying is is that. I do not know once who's who's selling the gun, if it's sold, if they're going to sell it, do a background check on it once it's being sold, and it, it just becomes a very difficult proposition from the city standpoint to try to track and enforce those issues. It makes it very difficult, and then there's nothing to say that they couldn't cut an outside deal with somebody and then just sell it to them down the street. On Monday, you know, it's it's just a difficult without it having a law to back it up. And my point to that is, there's a way around every single law <laughs> that there is on the books. I mean, talk about immigration, you kind of talk about whatever. People break the law all the time. They go around the law, make it gray or whatever. That shouldn't preclude people from. Making, making guidelines, putting forth guidelines that people should respond to. And you know, you hear the axiom a lot. You know, the laws are just for the folks that are just going to, you know, abide by them. The people that are going to break them are going to break them. I agree with that. But one of our, one of my philosophies on governing is that not only are laws things that are strict enforcement, but they also set culture. They set tone. And that tone will reflect to the 80, 90, 95 percent of people that will abide by them. So to say that we can't do it because there's going to be ways around it, there's going to be, it's going to be difficult to do, I, I disagree with. I think that part of our duty is to make sure that, sure that there is a, a, a culture of responsibility that goes along with this, along with just the, the ability to have free business, free you know, free hobbies, all these other things. So, like I said, I I've stated what my position is. I, however, the council wants to move on it is its choice. But um, I think I said what I need to say. I was just going to say, Mark, that from my standpoint, that's a policy decision that you have to right. make. From my standpoint, trying to enforce something that doesn't have a law. Uh, that makes it illegal is difficult on my behalf. It, and actually, it wouldn't even come to me then. It would be, it would be the city, 
the city is going to be. Right, but I mean, we've had other events. We've had a wrestling event or, you know, you know ultimate fighting or something. We say, well, you have to have so many security guards. Well, there's no law about how many security guards you have to have at the event. But we, re we require it, you know. So I'm just saying there's a lot of things that aren't laws that we require in our buildings because of how we want our city to run. So, like I guess I, I don't disagree that it's not the easiest thing to follow or track or whatever, but I think you can set the guidelines and the tone. And, and I think that goes, because, I, and part of it is because I'm optimistic about the type of people that go to these things. I think most of them are legitimate, law-abiding, you know, wanting to be helpful and responsible people. And I just think that this helps to emphasize that Anything else, sir? No. Uh, no, I do appreciate all the work you've done. You talked to talk to different cities, you know, talk to you know, Mr. Swanson. I appreciate all the work you've both done on this. And for me personally, um, I'm fine with what you guys did and went through <coughs> and talked to the other cities, Moose Lake, you know, Grand Forks and Carleton, Minnesota. And I'm fine with it. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has any questions on it or not. And Thomas, Mr. Riepel, I definitely want to see probably the five hundred dollars a day. I think a thousand dollars. We're not asking too much because they are charging to get into this event, and they're going to make something off of there. They are for profit. They're going to make money. As far as uh, adding any further regulations, I think they, the dealers the, the, he does a real nice job of what. What he does, I've talked to uh, another group that was looking at doing it. I talked to the Grand Forks group, and they said everything went fine. So I'd have no problem going through with this. So the event would be Friday night or Friday all day. So the the dates are are undetermined at this point because he's thinking June first. Now that was a week weekend he had talked about June first, second, third. That that's maybe coming too soon. For him to be able to promote it, but he hopes to do it a weekend in June. June first would be Friday. He would be the only person in the building that day to set up tables. Then vendors, I, I take that back. Vendors would come in Friday night and set up Friday night. The event would be open to the public Saturday and Sunday. Saturday roughly like a nine to five, and Sunday a nine to three. So Friday we wouldn't charge him full day. I, I think. My gut would say we wouldn't charge him a full day Friday to get, for him to be able to come in a few hours early and set up. Um, there wouldn't have to be a staff person there that whole day. It would just be literally it'd be opening the doors and making sure the lights are on and letting them go. Okay. Maybe if we charge him $1,000. Oh, $1,000? Yeah. Mike? Just wanted to weigh in that... Um, I support this event. I, I think that as if what I asked for was uh, some references from other places where, where this gentleman and his wife have <coughs> done events and you've done that and haven't found any problems as long as the city attorney and the police chief uh, sign off that they can support this and um, assure us that you know reasonably good chance that it's going to be a safe event, then I think it is, I think it's a good event for our city, and I, I, I'd be fine with charge, charging them $1,000 for the entire weekend. Anybody else have anything? There. That was my one thought as well. I absolutely support it. I think you guys have set it up well and done your homework, and as long as we do have our police force on board as being kept, we're aware of it, we can kind of halfway keep an eye on things, we're good with it. I like it. Okay. I have no issues with it whatsoever, and I'll make sure the officers are aware of it and, and make a couple of walkers right Okay. Anybody else have anything? I see none, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll go back to number five request to purchase forklift for Public Works Department. Mr. Stordahl. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, our current forklift does get for the age. It's 1984. It's in pretty rough shape. So we have uh, a council budget of $25,000 to purchase a new forklift. That's what we're bringing forward to today. 
Um, we're asking and recommending a uh, purchase from FM Forklift, uh, new Toyota Forklift for $21,489. That would be after, um, I guess, and also require surplus unit 172 of our current Ellis Channel we're seeing before. Uh, that 21000 price is after the trade in, and, uh, and then we'd have a trade in allowance as well, $2,000. Do we have any questions for Mr. Stordahl? I Tim. think we should move it on, and I think it's important that we keep up uh, our equipment. Mr. Riepel? Is there a warranty on this one, too? Yes, know. it's the same warranty. The same warranty yep. as the other one. Okay, yep. perfect. Anybody else have anything? See none, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Number seven, discussion of campground and joint powers agreement. Mr. Murphy. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we were finally able to meet with uh, Mr. Gary Hay from the DNR. <coughs> go through and, and talk about the upcoming season, the upcoming contract that we had a, uh, trouble getting together. We had some weather issues, and then Mr. Hay was sick, so um, it had to cancel. So we finally were able to meet with him. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time with him going through the previous practices, the um, the joint powers agreement that we just had. A, that uh, expired and what our potential for movement is on the upcoming agreement. So where we're at on that, um, based, based the revenues, how the revenues are calculated, calculated and how the expenses are calculated are pretty well set. Uh, they have been, um, they've come that way, become that way through a couple of different reasons. One is through negotiation throughout the years. The second one in his past practice has evolved over the last few years, particularly uh, when this contract first started. Um, we would just give them a number for what our expenses were. We've calculated it up and, and whatever. Um, as things progress, they've required more and more documentation, and I believe we're, um, we have a pretty good system with them now where we provide what our costs were for labor, for mowing, those type of things. We give them the work orders that we do keep track of with how we're doing the mowing now. Since they're, the mowing comes out of uh, the public works office, is coordinated through there, so we can track a uh, very good track of where the mowers are, how much time they spend at each place. So with that, they are satisfied with what we have been giving them for um, for that. So that being said, the numbers are is what they are. So where we would be coming in at is what we would we would have some room for negotiation or changing what the, the balance is or what the city receives for this is in the revenue sharing portion. Um, currently, uh, the revenue sharing is split 50-50 between uh, the DNR and the <coughs> City of East Grand Forks. Uh, and for 2016, which was the last year that the final numbers for, it was $34,326.82 um, additional that went to each group. Uh, what I have for the preliminary numbers for 2017, which are pretty solid, I guess, because my digits have not been audited, is that um, we're going to be very similar to 2016 for the overall numbers. Um, so the other item that was brought forward for some research and discussion was the Quonset uh, shed and what we should be doing for storage rental fees for that. Um, there are some pictures in your packet um, showing the interior of the storage shed. And the item where, um, particularly where the, um, where the uh, DNR uses. So if you look on what it shows on the bottom page 67, let's show that up to the side. So it's probably the best view of showing what is used for the DNR. He has that bottom picture there. They store a trailer, a couple of, what are those things called? Can you help me with that? Bears or Bears, something yeah. like that. Um, utility vehicles. Utility vehicles are stored there. Um, a couple other miscellaneous items. And then some, uh, if you look on the top right picture, there is some nicer pine furniture that they like to store indoors during the winter so that it doesn't get and then if you look along the shelf there in that top right picture again on page 67, there are, uh, they have some new fire rings that they're going to install that are more of like uh, 
safety rings, handicap accessible rings. They have there's an air pocket between the interior ring and the exterior ring so that people can fall against them or if they have wheelchair where they can touch them and they, they will not get burned. So I guess with that, um, the ENR's position on this would be any rent that we would be charging them for the storage of this for the winter. Um, they would be then adding as an expense um, to their overall expense line and, uh, items and then which would reimburse hurt. themselves. Hmm? Reimburse themselves at the end. Yeah. Which would then lower what we have for revenue sharing. So that would be the position that they would they would take on that. So that's where we're at with that. Um, I'll be quite honest, in reviewing this, um, I think we are fairly we're treated fairly fairly with by the DNR on this particular contract. Um, there are items on there that are not um, in the revenue sharing. Um, those are the gift card sales, the firewood, retail merchandise, um, and the, the large one is the res reservation revenue. Um, particularly all those uh, merchandise ones, those are pretty much a break even on those. They, um, the expenses are not charged in, into here either. Uh, so that's items that they they buy and then they resell. Uh, so uh, those are not added in there, and they're in their expenses, um, for like the building maintenance, fees, office of management and budget, community outreach, those kind of things. They take a, a small percentage of what the overall cost of. That is. So for example, in there says central office, the DNR central office in St. Paul. Um, it's charged 0.5 percent of the overall budget. <clears throat> so that's ninety thousand includes all that stuff you just read off. Yeah, that's where they get the ninety nine thousand three hundred. That, but that does not include the right. You know, getting hard sales part. Right. Okay. So. Has, has there has there ever been a study on the impact of that campground to the city? No, not an official study. I know there's been a lot to talk about it, but no, I have not. I'm not aware of any study that we've had as far as the economic impact. Just curious. It's healthy. It's huge. Well, that's what my, my question is. The point to my question. <laughs> I, get, I, I, I would agree. Not that Mr. Convetter gets anything from that. <laughs> Maybe some of do their taxes in the summer over there. <laughs> Henry, uh, are you dealing with the St. Paul office? No, the Bemidji office. Bemidji office. Yep. Uh, and Jeffy ben Ventura was a governor way. There was an interpretive center and uh, a park shelter, a storm shelter there. And uh, Jeff Jesse Ventura uh, took and vetoed it. And uh, has the state Bemidji indicated that they have started a storm shelter uh, proceeding at all that would be in the bonding bill? No, actually they, they, what they have said is they, they are not looking at putting something like that in, in this particular instance. What they are doing is they, their capital funds are going towards what they call destination parks. And there's a few of them that they have listed. I, for example, a task of state park. Um, some of those ones up on the North Shore of Duluth, uh, those those are the ones that they're prioritizing their capital dollars for um, in this upcoming budget cycle, which I believe them is a two-year cycle. So no, they're not. Th it is not in their in their short-term plans at all for for this particular park. Did he? Uh, did you get any uh, indication on pre-bookings as to how they're doing or? You get that from the lady that's managing it. Usually, we get that from the the manager out there. Um, yeah, the last time we talked, like the the opening holiday weekend, Memorial Day weekend, it's already like eighty percent capacity at this time. So it'll be it'll be sold out for all those major Canadian holiday weekends again. That's good. Anything else, Senator? No, no, that's all I was interested in. Mr. Grassle. 
Do we get a definition on what they said destination? Yeah. What is what is their highest? Is it a highest population destination? Is it? I have is that. It, yeah, I could. It, they have a strategic obviously plan. Obviously, East Grand Forks is not high on the, the priority on their priority of yeah. destination. But if we're up, we're up. If our reservations are higher than wherever, wouldn't we be considered a high destination? I, the last time I checked in that term of, unless their terms are different from, there might be a cutoff between here and St. Cloud how that gets determined. <laughs> that's but, a, that's the key. And, and, the, and where I got that information from is in reading their strategic plan is, and that's the, D, the Minnesota DNR Parks and Trails strategic plan. It talks about, it, it category, categorizes every park within their system in three areas. It's either destination, classic, or rustic, and it, it to my the way that I read the plan and what it tells me when I read it is that it are, it's those and I don't don't quote my numbers, but let's say it's the top twenty most attractive, biggest land area parks. The I, the, I use the example of the Itasca, or if you go to the North Shore and you the where they're getting half million visitors a year, and they may not be campers, but they're foot traffic visitors. Those are the types of parks they're considering to be destination parks that that's where their first priority for infrastructure dollars are being assigned. And then the next level park is a classic park, which is where the Red River State Recreation Area falls. When I look at those numbers and I, and I read the plan, and I haven't had a lot of discussion with the DNR about how I think the plan reads maybe versus what they mean by it, but they don't the number of visitors or the number of campers a year or the amount of total revenue um, is a part of that equation, but it's not the whole equation to how they decide that. And because within the grand scheme of the whole state park system, I think the fact that our, we have a very small property in that s scheme and it's a campground primarily, um, certainly it has a lot of users and a lot of overnight stays but it doesn't fall on the top of their list as far as the age or the need for facilities um, or the visibility that those other parks have. Okay. The males have any questions or everybody's fine with the way it is? Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. Oh, I agree. I think this agreement is pretty sound. I would argue that we should include the storage facility. Um, it may be a small part of what we do, but it would be in the same principle of saying, well, yes, we do mowing, and well, if we took that out of there, we could raise the revenue of everything and just half it by, <laughs> have more to split, but in the meantime, we're not getting paid for what we're doing. And I think we need to get paid for what we're doing and if it means somewhat of a smaller split, at least we're getting paid for half of it. Um, and I just think it's a it's a more honest way to go about our business. We could do it the other way too. Instead of putting it on their expense, don't charge them anything and just having it our expense as a subsidy expense, and and take that as 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 a as a credit towards the towards the remainder balance, I guess. So. I guess I I just believe that if we're going to account for things, let's account for things. If we're not, if it's just going to be a free for all, even at the margins, then it's going to be a free for all on everything. So. Any else? Any question, Mr. Murphy? You want to address that? Or? Yeah. I, what I can do is I will talk with Gary. I, I don't know that he's opposed to the idea of it being addressed in there, but I just wanted to make it clear that that would be something that we do. How we how we address it, I guess we can look and see what's most advantageous to us here as a city, and even if it is like it just where it gets added on one side and taken off the other, we can do that. Well, you add it on one side, and you get paid in full, and then you get cut on the other side in half, so at least you're getting so, half of yeah. what you deserve instead of nothing, or $40 or whatever we agreed to, or some ridiculously. So if that's case, I will do, do the uh, really get the best deal that I can on that, and I'll bring it back for the next, uh, whatever 
work session, or excuse me, whatever uh, council thing you will for the time wise, bring it back for approval. Okay. Anybody else have anything? If not, I move on to number eight request to name the Grand City's bike system. Here again. Reed, that you might be part of this too. Has anyone at the table or around the room been part of this conversation of attaching a person's name to our trail system? Has anyone been part of any of that? Okay, so as I come and go various days from my office, I run into Hiro pretty often, and Hiro is really involved in transit of all kinds, you know, transportation planning, and Hiro serves on a group that is for Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, so the Greenway organization. And they had kind of a, a loose understanding of that their trail system would carry the name of an individual, a person. And they didn't know for sure if it was just a little part of their trail system or all of it. And so they're going ahead and, and formalizing then the naming of their trail system after an individual. And Hiro asked me if I thought that same name could carry to our trail system or if we should have a person of our choosing carry the name of our trail system. And I said, you know, I think we should probably have an East Grand Forks name attached to the East Grand Forks trail system. Um, Hiro has a name of an individual that is probably would be a very good choice, but I wouldn't like that that would just happen quietly without any conversation because it becomes an amenity for all of us it becomes a public gathering place and I would want it to carry the goodwill of the people even in the selection of a, of a name to go along with our, our trail system so if it's okay with you all I would like to have Hiro back and, uh, and then he can carry with him also the knowledge of what the conversation has been to this point there would be of course lots of good people who are strong in recreation from East Grand Forks who would be well associated with our trail system. And how that might affect, say, a group that wants to do a naming of one little portion of it, which we've been dealing with for their special ride and their special event. We'd have to make sure we carry that also, that we could take out a part of it and identify with a name or a group if we chose to do that. So, first of all, I guess I'd raise the question, are, are you willing to just have a name uh, that, that would largely be driven by the Grand Forks group or the, or the group that oversees the whole Greenway carried to our part of the trail system, or should we have our own name, our, a member of our community associated with our trail system? Any thoughts? Would the question be, wouldn't they, would they be willing to use the name that we give for their whole system. <laughs> Good question. Isn't the one up north where you need to sign up ready, right? Correct? The trail? Yeah. Goes past, starts at the wall, yes. and goes north, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. So that would that be, this would be the whole system that you're saying? You know, that's their plan, is to take an overarching name <coughs> that goes to their whole trail system and then you could have parts of it also dedicated to an individual or a group. Um, if I could jump, sorry, sure. if I could jump in. And just one quick thing. It's not the trail system. It's yeah. the whole bikeway system. There you go. So not just what's in the Greenway. This would be the entire bikeway <coughs> system. So anything on public streets, any bike lanes, those types of things. Any sharrows. Any sharrows, yes. <laughs> anything <laughs> within, <laughs> anything yeah. within the yeah. right And for them, the bike truly portion, yeah. right? All of it. Correct. Yeah. Everything on the map. Nancy Asshole. covered a lot of what I was going to say, but I, I sit on the Greenway Technical Committee, the partnership between the City of Grand Forks, the Grand Forks Park District, our city, and the Minnesota DNR. That group has not been formally asked to name that trail system, nor have we had conversation to. I think that Hiro has had a couple of sidebar conversations with people about an interest in it. And I don't know what the conversation has been of those. But just to clarify that, that group is not currently <clears throat> looking at naming that system after anybody, nor has it been formally asked to. But to Nancy's point, this is the entire bikeway system, which certainly the Greenway trails are included in the bikeway system, uh, but is still separate from the rest of the, the bikeway. So the Greenway committee is not... We can assume that they're not... 
one saying they want to name our side. And right. So it's just one person. And, and then just kind of the process that I, I would see that going. I don't know the history of the Greenway and how that committee was formed and the, the you know, you you all know it well much further and better than I would at this point. But I would I would think that um, that'd be something to look at if just East Grand Forks wants to name their portion of it. That committee would certainly want to still be part of that conversation or may have something to say about it. And I guess the reason I did what I did is to bring it out into the daylight. Is it belongs out in the daylight, right? And I love your input. You know, to help me understand that it does include all of the bikeway and um, whatnot. So. And there's still a lot of confusion on the Grand Forks side mm -hmm. um, between Hyro and Grand Forks. Mm -hmm. So again, we would be separate. Um, they named their bikeway system at one point, the Andy Hampson bikeway system, and they passed a resolution. And the MPO is arguing that it never fully went through, and Grand Forks is arguing that it has. And so maybe we just have a couple of names and just kind of sit back and wait for their process to kind of get through the muddy waters before we pick up our own. We so. can make it clear to them that if indeed they follow through, it is Andy's name that's being considered again for the Grand Forks or the collective one. But I think if we just simply say we'll be outside of that, we don't need that to carry over to our portion of the bikeway, and then we can undertake a process if we want to attach a name to that, then we can do that separately. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Edu Mayor for bringing this up and at least in including us in the conversation early. Um, I can see a benefit to naming things outside of just honor. You know, you look at the, if you go up to High Road's country, you know, if you go on Highway 1, it's, what is it, the uh, Matthew Fox, or not Matthew Fox, the, the guy that lost his legs and walked across Canada. You know, it's the Fo the Fox Highway, and it's kind of a neat thing. It might draw some things. Terry Fox. I don't, was it? Terry Fox. Terry Fox, there you go, thank you. Um, and it's kind of a neat thing. It kind of brings some history and, and stuff like that. I don't think that it's merit. It, it comes to that merit in this case. I don't. I don't know if Andy Hampson rings a bell in East Grand Forks. I would certainly not delegate our ability to name in East Grand Forks to Grand Forks. If we decide to do something joint, I would say that we have our ability to designate, and they would have theirs, and maybe we could come up with the same person. Secondly, I don't. I wouldn't prefer to do the whole system, I think, I don't know, I just think there's so much to, and to it, and in some parts, it's the people's, <laughs> people's trails, and um, I think sometimes we go a little bit too far on naming, and sometimes that diminishes those things that we do honor with names, um, so I would, I know we, we've discussed in the past about, you know, for Officer Olson's you know, section, and I, I wouldn't want to do something that would take away from that. And I, I think some reservation would be is more prudent than blanketing everything else with something else. I think sometimes that could allow that to get lost. So, my two cents. I, I don't want to be cynical or negative, but um, I. Naming a bike system seems, uh, I just don't have an appetite for it. it just, I don't think it's the sort of thing that, um, that you can point to and say this is named after him. It's like like naming the storm, storm <coughs> sewer system after somebody. It's a transportation thing. And I could see some merit in singling out the, the Greenway trails because it is a unique feature to Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, and it, it's, a, it's a signature attraction that we have that we can point to, that it's a quality of life thing. But I would still oppose naming that for anybody. I think we've already got a good brand for that system. It's called the Greenway Trails. Greenway is a good word. It's easy to say. It's everyone, I mean, it's been something that's repeated, been repeated so many times. I would hate to try and 
attach a name that sounds phony to it just because we want to honor somebody. I, I, I don't, I think it's got enough value and we've already got a good brand for the Greenway Trails. The bike system, I just, I just can't get excited about naming that for anybody. That's how I feel. Okay. Is that on the mayor's discussion? No, no I... Okay, we're not done yet. Nothing on that, I just want to... Hang on a second. Does anybody else have anything for the mayor on this? I think it's a good idea to... Let's, let's each of us, particularly you folks in Park and Rec, you in transit, um, maybe dig in a little bit, and probably we could get the one or two of these groups together at another work session and talk about it some more. And maybe we decide, as we've indicated, it, that conversation goes forward... Um, largely on the Grand Forks side, according to their preferences, and, and maybe we just sit tight for a while on our side. I think that's probably the most likely scenario that I can see. Okay. Thank you, sir. Henry? You. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. If you looked at, at the Grand Forks Herald this morning, why, uh, there was a drug case there, and, and our police got involved with it, and uh, one of the things I think is important that some of us are going to go down to the St. Paul legislative days and I'm hopefully going to see Dayton. If I don't see him now, I'm going to see him on some other matters. Uh, I have strong feelings at what's been happening. Uh, our, uh, our police are very, very busy on the drug thing and if you want to see how big it is, in a two, three state area, you buy the Fargo form on Saturday. Uh, there's cases that they got picked up people down near Fargo, down near Fergus Falls. They, they had truckloads of uh, marijuana. It was like a haystack, millions of dollars. In every case, they also had meth. And uh, the situation is bad. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, we should have at least the two states, North Dakota, Minnesota, go down to take all the adjacent deals. I, the more I see of it, the more I read about it and talk to people, I think it should be statewide. Uh, this marijuana and this mess and all of the heroin and everything else, uh, you're not going to stop it unless you do something about it. And it's very, very expensive. Uh, we're spending a lot of money now, and we're going to have to ask for an increase for our task force. And if I get a chance to talk to Dayton, we'll be talking to our representatives plus other representatives. I'm going to tell them what my feelings are. And uh, uh, we've got a responsibility to protect our people We've got a responsibility to protect our law officers. And uh, maybe the chief would like to add to it, but he's very well aware of it. Our court systems are busy. We're going to have to eradicate it like the bubonic plague. They kill the rats. It's as simple as that. Now, if you've got other things we should be discussing with our legislators, they're very willing to discuss other things. You can tell the mayor. You can tell Mark Olsted and uh, and our city administrator, what do you think is that we should be talking to the legislator and, and possibly the governor about that we feel should be done not only on a state basis but locally, what, what we want done. And uh, one of the things that's very important for us, especially uh, where we are, Thief River, Crookston and us, we have a higher education structure. It's important that we keep up what they're doing. They're modernizing constantly, and I think that's something that we have to do. We can't let everything go to pot. But if you got things that we should be discussing, you tell him, you tell Mark, or you tell me, and we'll do it. But there's no use to driving down there and, and uh, drinking a cup, a cup of coffee and says, long time no see. I haven't seen you since last year. Mayor. I would have to agree with Mr. Tweeton on what he said there and the fact that 
of the quality of life that we enjoy is a byproduct of so many things, and one of them is the excellent work of our law enforcement. I know for a fact that they, every day, are involved in, in keeping our city safe, and sometimes more than one a day event related to drugs, and, and taking that, that rot, that rot of this, this drug problem that we have, taking it out of our midst, and, uh, and keeping our kids safe, and keeping us safe, because very often it involves motor vehicles and, and whatnot, so, thank you again. Again, we enjoy a high level of safety in this community, and um, it's like it, it won't let up, but neither will we. That's the very good news. It seems like it's a hard one to manage. It's hard to completely eradicate it, but it's only exceeded by the, the tenacity and the endurance of our law enforcement. I know in our schools a lot of good things happen in this area. Hopefully you get around ahead of it with education and all the rest, but... Uh, I do appreciate what's happening every single day to keep this city the way that we like it. I'd like to make one more statement. I'm around an awful lot, you know, I've got lots of time and I see what's going on and I'm very familiar with the drug situation. I could write a book on it because on it, uh, I've seen lots of it. But we are very fortunate. We've got an excellent police department. We have an extra, we have a good sheriff's department. They're excellent. And our task force is excellent. And how serious this is, you check to see how many border patrolmen are employed by the federal government that works the task force. Isn't that right, Chief? Currently but I'd like to have him make a comment. Because we do currently have four border patrol agents as part of our drug task force. Mr. Murphy. I think this is a different subject here, but one thing that has come up. Um, we have had a request um, from our parks rec department to our parks rec department uh, to uh, apply for a grant for uh, through the parks. The last time we applied for this was in 2015, and it was for the pool. Um, so, it, and it is due here at the end of this month. So, I guess it, 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 I want to get some consensus or direction from the council that this is something that we should uh, put some reads time into it. Or, uh, shelters. Thank you. The grant program, it's called the Outdoor Recreation Grant Program. We received $50,000 to go towards the swimming pool project. It's funded through the Minnesota DNR. It's available to apply for every year. From It's a 50% matching grant, anywhere from $5,000 up to $150,000. Um, so we can certainly apply for something. We can apply for multiple projects. Falling underneath the category of that is improvements to your park infrastructure, shelters, um, equipment, sidewalks, trails. So if we want to apply, um, the, f the first thing I I'd like input from all of you on is if, there, if you can find a priority of a project that we could put together enough of an application to have it seem, you know, like a, like a big enough project that it would gain some, some merit or some interest from that funding source. Um, certainly we have a lot of projects, I call the, would call them at this point still maybe small projects. We have some shelters that could use some refurbishing. We have in plans this year some budget set aside for uh, the concrete sidewalks around playgrounds to improve the, the ADA accessibility. Um, so we could certainly use some of those kinds of projects and, and put an application. And the, the only thing, caveat to go with that is is are we comfortable just doing just a park shelter and a pl concrete playground border and um, having, I would call that maybe a smaller project in the scheme of some of the applications that this party might see, or do we want to um, consider holding an application for this year and then organizing something more, maybe more broad based that would cover the ADA needs of our playground system as a whole, our park system as a whole for a future application in future years. That's kind of the where my mind is and the two things I, I would weigh with that. Mr. Grass. I would think that we don't have that money budgeted to start yeah it's nice to get a 50, 50 match but we got to have 50 to spend. And yeah. one to one. We, do, we do have it's some money one to one. it's 50-50 yeah, and we do have some money set aside this year in the building maintenance fund there's, there's $40,000 earmarked for shelters this year 
and we have thirty thousand dollars earmarked for those concrete playground borders for this year. So there is, for, and that's for 2018. I'm sorry, that's for 2018. This project, if we were awarded through this application cycle, it would take place this fall and into 2019. I. Personally, I'd like to see us have park shelters, and, and I have a very good reason for it. Uh, we have some beautiful locations, and I'm a firm believer that it will increase the population of the city. Take Stouts Park and take O'Leary Park. And uh, the, <coughs> the, the thing is, we've got beautiful parks, and we've got the people, but we, we've got to take and Get, get something so families can get together. Reed, do we still have areas of playground equipment that is kind of old and, and worn out? That, you know, if That's you budgeted, gotta be updated too. Yeah, so then you, you, you basically take the stuff you intended to do, add these other things to it, and that becomes your, your new double amount. We want to emphasize families. Now, what's happening, whether people realize or not, in the library, we can tell that we're getting more families because uh, mothers are coming in, especially in buying uh, children's books. So we do have people moving in. And I think at the point area, I might be wrong, Nancy Ellis could tell me if I am, but I think we've got a, about 2,000 people living on the point, don't we, Nancy? Close? Close. Yeah. But we have a playgrounds down there so I would say to answer your question mayor there are a couple of parks that still have the the old if you maybe it's 70s or 80s style playground equipment not many there are a couple um, we put new some new equipment in at Stelz Park last year and have plans for this summer to remove that old equipment already I think our bigger concern would be in accessibility of our playgrounds. We do not have, we're certainly not compliant in that across the board. Um, I just met last week with an individual from the league about that and the city our size. Uh, it's just recently been kind of brought to the daylight that a city our size is supposed to have a transition plan for those parks, um, which we will have to start working on on developing that. So that, I would say, is the biggest need and going to be the biggest cost at some point. And that's what I fear about, that's why I kind of wanted to bring this forward to this group, is this application, I don't know in the next three weeks that we can be prepared to put forth the proper application to address those needs. And we certainly could for shelters and sidewalks that would make the sidewalks accessible, um, but to address the ADA accessibility in our playgrounds, we wouldn't be able to do that in that short time frame. Okay, Mark. Thank you. What, can you repeat the amount you had budgeted for the shelters and then the... 40, 40. 40 and 30. 40, 40, 40. In 2018 and 2019, we have 20 for shelters and 16 for sidewalks. So the 40 and 30 is what? 40 is for shelters, 30 is for concrete, borders that's in 2018 right in 2019 we have 20 and 16 um, okay and that's all out of the building maintenance what does what's left how much have we spent of that all true stuff there's yeah well it, it's hard to say off the top of my head there isn't any, there isn't, from the current two years of ultra money we've received, there isn't any, there aren't any dollars that are unallocated at this point. There's about 42,000 unspent, but we have 38 of that tied up in the fencing projects for Staus and for It's Williams that we took out of the general budget for this year with the idea that we'd use the ultra funds for that. So. Through year two of the ultra money, that's what we've received to date. It's, it's basically all spent. And when I say basically, I just submitted a grant last week to the Minnesota Twins Foundation for a Field for Kids project to hopefully we could use that funding instead of ultra funding for the Gets Williams fencing. Because so, you know, that's about what, 40,000, 45,000 a year or something? 
Forty-five thousand a year. Uh, but I'm just wondering. Eight more so years. As this goes, like if you were looking at a spring nineteen construction date, mm -hmm. would the matching funds be due at that point? Yeah, we, we wouldn't receive if we applied through this year's program. We wouldn't receive the funds until our project is completed, which would likely be summer of two thousand nineteen. So it, if we wanted to move everything down and say, well, let's go for this grant next year, it would be the summer of 2020 before that project was completed. Well, I guess my thoughts are if we could leverage some of those dollars, mm -hmm. the more you can leverage them, you can leverage that other 50%. Is there any restrictions on where the money comes from? You know, I know some state things say so much has to be, you can't leverage certain fund. If the, if the source is a state right, fund, it's got to be it can't local. be something else. But all true dollars should be unencumbered or whatever. But yeah, I'd something to look into. I guess my thoughts are obviously we can if we can use it to use do some sort of maintenance, it would be good. But I think and I think that the ADA stuff this is a, a whole another animal on its own. It's going to be big dollars that maybe you guys when you're down in St. Paul can start priming the pump for that knowing that that's going to be coming up in two years or three years yeah. or whatever. And like what that's going to be a big dollar. With our sidewalks, you create the plan, and it might take you 10 years to fully implement right. it. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, and primarily you start with just access to the park and a hard surface underneath the playground equipment is essentially what you need to start with. We're not referring to uh, ADA-accessible playground for someone that's handicapped. Right. We're just looking right now at being able to access the playground, whether you, mm -hmm. you know, are handy, you know, ADA compliant. That's that's the essential. So we could start looking at the number of parks we have and seeing what we need just to make it hard surfaced and sidewalks, and then go from there as to how, I mean, how much I guess more my, we want to do. So. My thought is putting that off of this little discussion. I don't think that's the right spot for it. But I would go and maybe. Yeah, I would use our past successes and what we've done well in our park stuff, especially our outdoor parks. If you look at the Sherlock, for, you know, that's a destination. It's something that draws from all over. It's something that is <laughs> is a great has great reviews across the board. I think that's something, and I don't want to build something like that again, or that's that again. But I think. If you think about that as a success, it's something that's unique, it's something that's different, it's big, it's accessible. Those type of things are things that we should be thinking about. And when I think about what we should be doing, I, I've had a discussion with, uh, with Chad and Reed. I, you know, one small thing we could do is be, start looking at you know, exercise, outdoor exercise equipment at our trailheads along our trail as a part of some sort of a network of exercise. Uh, apparatuses or something. That would be one thing. Um, fishing piers, f portable floating fishing piers would be a huge hit around here. People would love them. Primarily because I think it would increase access. Right now, if you've ever fished off the bank of the river, it gets a little bit dicey. Mm -hmm. I think this you can make, you can have them ADA accessible, those type of things. You can get them for reasonably cheap and you can start at one or two. I think something on the Red Lake River would be awesome. Um, another idea, and I've, something I've heard a lot about, um, when we did our park plan for Lafave Griggs Park area a while back, one of the features that was brought up then was a natural playground. I know a lot of people really like them. I, now, they're typically ADA uh, accessible by nature. They're you know pretty rustic, rugged things, but you can you can put them together for a reasonable amount, you know, and I think something like that would fit really well in that area where we have a huge, if you want to put it back in cell phone network, we have a, a hole in our coverage um, in that area, and I think something in that area or even attached to or lower than like where Zavro's Frisbee Park thing is something in those two areas with a natural park I think would be huge a huge destination here. You know, I think that would really not just service people here but it would bring more people and more attraction to the city. So those are would be three things that 
they might be too big to do for 19, but as we think about things in the future, those are three um, options. The, the couple that I would throw in, which we've already talked about, one, uh, they say before long, the access, the boat access on the Red River is going to have to be looked at, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere down the way. And we've talked about cleaning up along River Road and 12th, cleaning up the brush, mm -hmm. and maybe improving the Dick Grassle Handicap Accessible Fishing Hole right there. You know, maybe along the lines of what you're saying, that's a great connection to that trailhead, and then it goes straight down. And safety-wise, too, to drop that brush, you know, for, for just visibility, sight lines, and, and security and safety and everything. Yeah. So that could be part of the conversation, too. So all, all very good projects. Just to clarify, this program wouldn't be able to fund any of those because okay. those are all DNR property. Oh, and, okay. and this, it's a DNR-funded program, so it can't fund DNR projects. Um, certainly some of the stuff that Mr. Demers mentioned. I think, so the, I think the kind of the root of the question here is I'm hearing that we all have a lot of ideas for big, maybe bigger projects. If we wanted to submit an application for this year and the next few weeks, my first thought would, as something achievable and able to put together, but certainly still a worthy project would be, let's focus on O'Leary Park. Um, we have plans, the money is set for the concrete borders around there, we could probably throw together the numbers to update some of that playground equipment, the swing sets, um, to improve that accessibility. If we wanted to add a small or a couple small picnic shelters in the front, we could look at that. That is something small scale in the next couple of weeks we could probably put together. We'd have to bring forward a resolution uh, on Tuesday, next Tuesday, for you all to vote on um, to show support for that. Do you intend to do picnic shelters at Staus, or is that not on the radar for you guys? Could that be part of this as well? Every any park is a separate application. Oh, okay. so it's got to be one. Yeah, for it. gotcha. Um, but yes, that's some of the money that's set aside this year. That's kind of what I had. What it, where are my plans is to look at the shelters that are existing but are in poor condition, Staus Park, Nash Park, and try to rehab those first before we add more. Did anybody else have anything at this time? One, what's the, do we know what the pool of money is? Yeah, there's $825,000 available this year. And we got 50000 how many years we ago? Can, we got 50000 two years ago. 2015. 2000, yeah, 2015. And, and so that's a, a factor in it, too, is how often are, is one city going to get a repeat award. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Thank you, sir. Is there anything else? I know you. No, you that was why I was. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Now, entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, second by Grass, a second by Pachavinsky. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. Meeting is adjourned.